the commission prepared guidance on how these funds in particular the european social fund support the homeless people social inclusion and employability in various ways such as through supporting services training centres and social economy uh, programmes these programmes are of benefit to individuals as well as uh, the com uh, communities so uh, practically everything what has been mentioned in terms of concrete action in this discussion the commission has already doing and has already encouraged the member states uh, to do in order to tackle uh, homelessness uh, to the specific uh, uk dimension of this discussion let me just say that uh, the british experience in the area of tackling homelessness is one of those which we have been uh, promoting uh, the housing first strategy especially as it was implemented under the former mayor Ken Livingstone indeed made a lot of progress uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the uh, UK to, to uh, uh, eliminate or reduce very significantly uh, uh, homelessness and, uh, and this has been uh, uh, very explicitly uh, mentioned in, in our documents so um, I, I very much regret that Mr. Clark has been very uh, kind of inaccurately informed about what I was saying in the British uh, media um, about the country because I definitely never said that the UK is a nasty country. It's not my words. Um, unfortunately, some uh, newspapers uh, uh, reported this um, in, in an inaccurate uh, way and in the wrong uh, uh, context. And it's also untrue that the Commission would be, so to speak, promoting mass migration. The Commission wants to ensure that the freedom of movement is uh, respected in the European Union in all countries, and this was a subject of the debate uh, yesterday, and I think it created a lot of clarity in a sometimes confused uh, uh, debate. We would, um, uh, from the side of the Commission, be very happy to continue working with the members of the House. We would like to see more members of the European Parliament in our meetings, like the People Experiencing Poverty uh, Conference. Uh, um, I know it's um, uh, 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 sometimes uh, MEPs face time shortages, um, but, um, but we have a number of conferences, including the, the uh, Convention of the Platform Against Poverty, including a forthcoming conference on social innovation where uh, related issues can be discussed. We work with the NGOs. We fund uh, a large number of NGOs uh, who are active in uh, this area, and we remain committed to this cause. We, we have been funding very innovative approaches like for example the cooperation of railway companies to tackle uh, uh, homelessness and um, uh, if there is need for information about this of course we are ready to uh, provide and we are really uh, strongly committed to maintain the anti-poverty dimension of the Europe 2020 uh, uh, strategy which was mentioned by uh, Madame Beres. Thank you very much. Monsieur Andor. Thank you very much Commissioner Andor. Five motions for resolutions to close the debate. One of the debate is now closed, and the vote will be taken today in the, at noon. This takes us to the next item on the agenda, which is the Commission statement on non-discrimination in the framework of sexual and reproductive health and rights. I give the floor to the Commission, and that's Commissioner Callas. Madam President, honourable members. <coughs> The Commission fully recognises that each and every individual has the fundamental right of access to high quality health care. Despite the work done and the results achieved over the years, problems of inequalities and discrimination sadly still remain in Europe. We therefore need to continue and increase our efforts to eliminate all forms of inequalities and discrimination, including discrimination based on gender and sexual orientation. We must also continue to actively promote equality between men and women. With the aim of contributing towards a healthier and fairer Europe, the Commission organized an event on this theme last October and will convene a conference in March on this issue. Health must be for all. Everybody should have access to good quality health care, regardless of gender, age, race, 
sexual orientation, disease, social status, education or country of residence. Health free of prejudice and discrimination and with full respect to all beliefs and behaviours calls for the involvement of the whole of society. It involves, for example, education, justice, social affairs, in short, all the different constituent areas that collectively make up our societal models. Sexual and reproductive health forms, of course, part of the health status of the population and equally needs to be considered within a perspective of equality and non-discrimination, both inside and outside the European Union. We must strive to do better. For example, it is unacceptable that even if comparatively low in the European Union, maternal mortality is still a problem and is significantly high within some vulnerable groups. It is unacceptable that female genital mutilation still exists in the EU as well as in the wider world. It is unacceptable that many forms of violence, which clearly have an impact on health, are still deemed in certain quarters to be justified by custom, tradition, culture, privacy, religion or honour. President, honourable members, let me finish by reiterating that the European Commission stands amongst the staunchest opponents of inequality and discrimination in all its forms. Whilst respecting the national competences of the Member States, the Commission actively supports governments to ensure that health systems have the capacity to deal effectively with health needs and that equality and fairness are championed at every opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you now for the groups. Mrs. Bauer, please, two minutes. Thank you. With full respect to the Article 168 of the Lisbon Treaty, the EPP group is standing firmly on the position that sexual and reproductive health and rights are under subsidiarity and as such belong to the competence and responsibility of Member States. It was clear that different traditions, different situations, different legislation in Member States divide the European public opinion as well as this House, as it was clear last time when the Parliament denied the so-called Estrella report. We cannot impose or recommend solutions which are profoundly unacceptable in different Member States on such sensitive issues. What we can and should do is to support the improvement of health care of pregnant women and mothers to improve the conditions for reproductive health as maternal mortality is still high in some member states, as it was uh, stated by the Commission. On the other side, the statistics show that 15 per cent of couples are infertile. In this field, the Commission should facilitate the exchange the exchange the best practices. What we can and should do is to follow the principle of non-discrimination as one of the main values of the Union in the accessibility of health services. What we can and should do is to step up effort on elimination of violence against women and girls, not just because it is often concluding in deteriorating of sexual and reproductive health, but it is also a serious offence of human dignity. What we can and should do is strengthen the fight against FGM as a special form of violence, also present in the European Union, what often stays hidden and not punished. There is a big room for better law enforcement because many violent acts against women and girls go unpunished while victims are stigmatized. Thank you. Merci, Madame Boer. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Bauer. Before I give the floor to Mrs. Garcia Perez, can I just welcome all the visitors in the Distinguished Visitors Gallery, a group of women working in family planning and who I'm sure are following very closely. Mrs. Garcia Perez, please. Thank you, Madam President. 
Now, some people didn't want this debate to take place today. Some people asked whether the European Union had competence here to talk about what is a fundamental issue, uh, namely freedom and dignity of women, a fundamental value. Europe cannot uh, be passive in this matter uh, where Mariano Rajoy's government is trying to stem the fight of women in their struggle for freedom and dignity. In Spain today, it's not necessary to change the law. Rather, uh, we have to impose, uh, or rather the attempt is to impose a moral on women from the government's part. Uh, now, the law as it stands uh, doesn't oblige anyone to uh, carry out abortions. However, the law that is being proposed would uh, impose things on women who don't want uh, to have a baby. Now, the law uh, to protect the unborn fetuses is what's being proposed. But if we want to protect the unborn and we want to stop people living below the poverty line, then we need to make sure women uh, have the uh, choice of uh, whether to have children, particularly if they live in dependent families and if they live in difficult social conditions. As, as well as that, it's a discriminatory law because women uh, with uh, good economic resources uh, will be able to travel to other parts of the European Union, whereas women with fewer economic resources uh, will be forced to carry out uh, illegal abortions. Uh, and as a result, women in Europe will have less uh, rights than their predecessors. Thank you. Next is Mrs. Innitfeldt. Mr. Cashman. We it's very important. The clock isn't actually working in accordance with your timer. So it makes it very difficult for us to conform with Absolutely. the time limitations which have been uh, given to us. Perhaps uh, Merci the de le rappeler. En effet, essayé... Thank you very much. I, I try to uh, do it by the rule of thumb, have one and a half minutes, and we'll try to make sure that's fixed um, so that people know where they are. Mrs. Innenfeld, two minutes. Well, because before I make my point, I would like to state here that I give my support to Spanish women who are EU citizens like all of us and entitled to equal treatment. With regard to the point of subsidiarity, I believe the EPP is being slightly hypocritical here and applying double standards because this House uh, adopts many resolutions on a, w a wide range of issues in which we have no competence. I remember an EPP rapporteur who once did a report on the rights of circus animals. So we cannot talk about the rights of Spanish women, but we can talk about circus fam uh, animals. The EPP supports the so-called Alliance for Families which is understood as families in the conservative traditional sense. So is that EPP co or, or uh, EU competence? You're applying double standards and I don't like it. Uh, as the Commissioner rightfully said, sexual and reproductive health rights are part of our national health systems. We have an EU public health strategy, but sexual and reproductive health rights is a glaring omission. Why? Why can we talk about Alzheimer, obesity or colon cancer and we cannot talk about the things that affect us every day that are so important? Then about the Spanish government, I really wonder, is this the most pressing problem the Spanish government has to solve these days? Haven't you got anything better to do? And is it true that Spanish women have massively resorted to abortion because it was legal? It's a well-known fact that in countries where abortion is legal, the abortion rates are low. And then finally, if you think that women are competent to decide on something as important as having children and raising them, or if you think women are competent enough to run, say, Germany or the IMF, then surely they are competent enough to decide about their own bodies and their own lives. So let's give support to Spanish women. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Madame Inveld. Thank you very much, Mr. Inveld. Next, Mr. Romero, for one and a half minutes. Señor Comisario, estamos... Commissioner, we are faced with an issue of fundamental rights and the proposed reform of sexual and reproductive rights 
in Spain is to trample roughshod over the rights of women. It's on the part of conservative and reactionary forces. This is a macho uh, attitude uh, to life and is one which breaches human rights. Now, Spain is a signatory to various international agreements and there are also European uh, rules on sexual and reproductive rights and we are now going to be consigned to the ranks of those countries which flout international laws and human rights because women are being viewed as subjects without rights and their desires have to be discarded on spurious grounds and abortion will become the privilege of the upper classes we will have discrimination on economic grounds which will drive women to seek illegal abortions at risk to their lives and health. This is not a necessary law. It is classist, it is anachronistic and it is inappropriate and certainly not in keeping with the age. And that is why, Commissioner, we must do everything in our power to make sure that this bill does not come to pass. Thank you, Mr. Romeva. Next. Is Mr. Legutko, one and a half minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, after this revolting document called the Estrella Report was defeated in this chamber, the left has come back with another ideological offensive. The concept of a reproductive right is absurd. It is nothing but an ideological ploy to condone <clears throat> the morally dubious practices. This is what the left did in the past, and this is what they are doing today. The particularly alarming consequences of the so-called reproductive rights are the massive violations of human conscience. The conscience clauses have been suspended, removed, or drastically limited. The doctors, priests, teachers, lawyers, state factionaries, ordinary people are forced to do what is morally wrong. All this is simply outrageous and cannot be accepted. If this is a direction in which the EU is going, I am afraid we are on the threshold of a dark age. Thank you, Mr. Legutko. There is a blue card from Mrs. Estrella. Do you accept that? Madam Estrella. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to ask our colleague if he read my report because he doesn't seem to replicate what it says. It's not. Uh, do you not think it's time to respect the rights of women? Monsieur Legutko? Uh, yes, I have read the report and uh, I consider, I repeat, it is a revolting document. Merci. L'incident est clos et la parole est. Thank you very much. That's the end of that. Mr. Gustafsson, one and a half minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Sexual and reproductive health and rights is um, it's a fundamental right. This is uh, the right to dispose of one's own body. And when it comes to sex education, we have got to uh, break the patriarchal mould which Im imposes um, these restrictions on women and takes the decision out of their hands. In Spain, what is the government doing? Basically, they are walking backwards. Of course, this is, there is a subsidiary dimension to this. The Spaniards can decide um, as they see fit. However, as a politician, I must say that when there are violations, breaches of human rights, uh, then we have a duty to uh, speak out, uh, whether that is in Sweden or Spain or elsewhere in the world. I am I'm duty bound to uh, speak out, fighting for the rights of Spanish women to 
um, have control over their bodies, this is symbolic. And it stands not just for them, but for women everywhere across the, the planet in a spirit of solidarity. And I hope that everyone will see what I'm holding up. It's, a, it's in order to attest to my solidarity for Spanish women. Thank you very much. Mr. Paxis, please. President, colleagues, not so long ago, on the 10th of December last year, when the Parliament voted on the Estrella report, on behalf of the EFD group, I tabled another draft where I said that the parents' right to bring up their children according to their religious or non-religious beliefs includes their right to refuse any inappropriate interference from governmental or non-governmental actors with the raising of their children. I was glad that back then the Parliament rejected the Estrella report and the majority of MEPs gave their support to another version of the draft resolution. Despite having rejected her draft resolution, today attempts are made to push through an embellished version of the old document disguised as a new commission statement on non-discrimination in the framework of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Colleagues, please respect the European Parliament's position. Well, thank you, Chair. I would like to understand, because a colleague Paxa says that um, the rights of parents to raise their children according to their own convictions, uh, those rights are being restricted. I would really like to know how the rights of parents are restricted by giving the right of choice to women. Nobody is obliged to have an abortion. Nobody is obliged to you know, use their access to family planning methods. How are the rights of parents restricted by giving more freedom, more choice to women? And in conclusion, Mr. Paxas, I'm so glad that I come from a country where abortion is safe and legal and people like you do not get to decide over my life and my body. Monsieur, Monsieur Paxas. Mr. Paxas, please. I am very happy that you come from a country which you like and uh, I spoke back on the 10th of December as I speak today and I speak against the Estrella report on uh, state institutions interfering with the bringing up children. Thank you very much Mr. Baxas. Next, Mr. Stadler, please, for a minute. Madame D. Madame Sinclair, motion d'ordre. Mrs. Sinclair, point of order, point of order, Mrs. Sinclair. Motion d'ordre, dites-nous. You have the floor, Madam Sinclair. It is a procedural point of order. Uh, President Schultz and I believe the Conference of Presidents has made it clear that if you are on a speaking list, you cannot have a blue card. Ms. Invelt was on the speaking list and she's been given a blue card. Can you please explain this, please? It's not allowed. I think that's one construction you can place on uh, the rule, but it's not the only one. I, I, Mrs. Invelt uh, asked for the blue card and was given that. Mr. Stadler, uh, and ask for, a, ask for a blue card if you wish. Mr. Stadler, please. President, in the Madam President, uh, yes, I'm going to be uh, waving blue cards as well, and perhaps you'll look my way occasionally. Now, we have been accused of hypocrisy, EPP accused of hypocrisy. Well, what is more hip hypocritical than having an item on sexual and reproductive health rights and using this to wage a campaign against the Spanish government? I mean, that's hypocrisy. I mean, you bang on about unemployment being the biggest problem in Spain, and then you are demanding abortion. I'm sorry, that is pure hypocrisy. You've got a debate here. You are dragooning the commission into that, and it's the Netherlands and being defeated twice over on the Australia report. So trying to get it in again through the back door, I mean, that is hypocrisy. I mean, it's precisely what you're accusing the EPP of. I would want fundamental rights to be safeguarded, and the basic right to life is the most fundamental right. Protection of life, of every living being, unborn citizens who cannot defend themselves, that is the most basic human right. Thank you, Madame Morin-Chartier, who has two minutes. 
Thank you, Madam President. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank the Commissioner who was able to focus on the core of this debate, even though things have spread since there a little. Uh, now, uh, the fundamental uh, rights of citizens need to be accessible to all, and uh, Europe uh, needs to be able to provide this access to health, uh, regardless of uh, creed and belief. I think we need to focus on uh, fighting against uh, maternal uh, mortality and uh, genital mutilation. Now I don't want things to be caricatured uh, neither from one camp nor from the other and it, the same thing happens in political groups. Uh, there should be no caricatures put forward in this argument and I should tell you that in France for 38 uh, years uh, we've had the veil laws which provide a perfect balance between the respect for uh, women's rights to health and the respect for life. The, she was a great Minister for Health. She was also President of this Parliament for the EPP. And I'm surprised that 38 years later we're seeing such conduct, such a dissension from the political groups when in fact we have balanced text which could be a platform for consensus. And that's what I would like to see, Madam President. Monsieur Van Dalen, vous avez... Thank you. Mr Van Dalen, do you have a point of order? Yes, President, I do have a point of order. Can I appeal to you, um, Madam President, that we respect the rules in this House and that we don't um, um, display all these pl placards and uh, posters, which are, I can see um, on that side of the hemicycle. And, I, Madam President, can you use, uh, respect the custom and, office, uh, custom and practice of the House and have these placards removed? Thank you, Mr. Van Dalen. I don't think that's um, a disrupting debate. I suggest that we proceed as uh, calmly as we commenced. Next is Mrs. Gurmai, please. Mr. President, uh, Commissioner, colleagues, thank you for making this statement today. Sexual and reproductive health rights are fundamental rights. Today's Europe should ensure equal rights and treatment and access for all. It is an issue of shared concern that requires a European approach. I cannot accept the fact that certain European women, due to their geographical location and or social status in Europe of the 21st century, will soon be denied the free choice and access to sexual and reproductive health rights, including abortion, like in Spain. I therefore call on the European Commission to defend those rights and the free choice of all women by promoting sexual education, medical assistance and support, prevention, contraception, the morning after pill and abortion. This should be affordable and accessible for all women and men. Moreover, guaranteeing sexual and reproductive rights is not only a health issue, but it is also contributes to women's empowerment and economic independence. Introducing stricter abortion law is not only saying no to abortion, it's also saying no to women's rights and turning back the clock 30 years to a time where religious lobbies were prevailing over women's rights. So we say again today, my body is my right. Merci, Thank you very Madame much. Gourmay, la parole. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gourmay. Next, Mrs. Bilbao Barandica for one minute, 30. Presidenta. Thank you very much, President. Sexual and reproductive health is an issue of fundamental rights and is part and parcel of the European model. We call for equality in health. That is part of democracy. And we do not want to revert to an age in which certain religious beliefs were imposed on the rest of society. Rather, we are defending the basic right of women to decide when and how they become mothers. And we resist this unilateral change to abortion laws because that will entail health risks for women of limited uh, means who will then have to resort to dangerous illegal abortions. There's been no social press for change. Rather, it's just some who believe that this will improve the electoral fortunes of the Spanish PP. That is why we are calling for support from European institutions, as the Estrella report did, to call up, draw up a code for women to have the right to sexual reproductive health rights. Thank you very much. Madame Bilbao Barandica, acceptez-vous? 
Thank you very much. Do you ex um, accept a blue card from Mr. Vila Cuadras? Sí, muchas gracias. Yes, thank you very much. Ms. Bilbao, uh, I'm not really standing up to take the floor to create a polemic, and I could uh, only echo part of what you said, but I really want some clarification. I'd like to know your opinion on two specific points. Firstly, do you think that a properly created legislation on abortion should seek to strike a balance between the rights of pregnant women, of course they have a right to certain fundamental rights, and the rights of the unborn fetus. Secondly, do you think that European governments should more actively promote public policies in education, social, welfare and health care uh, to keep in, uh, pregnant women from a position of precariousness uh, and if they can do that, should they? Madame Bilbao. Thank you, Mrs Bilbao to reply. Muchas gracias por sus. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that statement. What we believe and what I stated previously was that women should be free to decide when and how they give birth to their children. Secondly, I also said that I think that Europe should legislate clearly to protect women's rights in this regard because I believe that women need more protection and clearly anybody who is in a situation of economic precarity requires protection and that would mean that every individual will be able to freely decide on his or her future but what I'm talking about here is a freedom of women and I am not defending the position of the Spanish government because this uh, really would be retrograde. Merci bien, je... Thank you very much Mrs. Bilbao. Next, uh, Mr. Irtha, Irtha Balbaitia. One, one minute. Colegas. President, colleagues, Commissioner, I'd like to thank the Commission for having come back to this topic. Uh, this is a rather difficult topic. We're talking about a fundamental right, the right of women to decide upon uh, how and when to conceive. Now, this is a right that the Commission needs to defend and protect. Now, this debate has taken place today because uh, Spain is uh, planning to change its right, its law, and this change in law is going to be a step backwards, both in the rights of women and in gender equality. There will be no real gender equality if women uh, have no right to decide upon uh, motherhood. And the right to decide for women uh, is essential. We need to have the same rights in place for all women across Europe. Thank you. Mr. Van Dalen, one minute. Madam President, firstly, on a point of order, just to repeat uh, what I said earlier on when I spoke on a point of order, which is to say that um, usually placards are removed. And I hope that you'll take this back to the conference of um, group leaders so that we can have a single, a, a clear rule, because this is very haphazard, and that's really no way to run a railroad. And so I please do refer this back to the powers that be about the placards being removed. Now, President, I think that uh, life must be protected before birth and after birth. I'm well aware that there are difficulties attendant on um, pregnancy and on motherhood. And it's only right that there should be professionals and family members there to help. But with the, we had the Estrella report, and a majority of the House said this was not a matter for Brussels, it was a matter for the Member States. Now, I wish the Spanish uh, members of Parliament to Madrid uh, great wisdom in taking decisions. I hope they'll come to the view that life must, is sacred must be protected. Thank you very much. You have a, a blue card <coughs> from Mr. Romeva. Do you accept that, Mr. Van Dalen? Dear colleague, I see you are very worried about this kind of messages. Are you in the same opinion of the flags you have behind you? Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Van Dalen. There is a second question to a blue card from you, from Mrs. Uh, Jimenez. You may wish to take them both together. Mrs. Jimenez, please. Uh, Señora Presidenta, no estoy en... Madam, well, I don't really understand the rules on the blue card because I thought that somebody who had taken the floor was not allowed to use a blue card, but it's up to you, of course. But I saw uh, that uh, I've forgotten the name of the gentleman, but had been uh, raising uh, the blue card um, to, to put it a question uh, to the last speaker on what he said, please. Bien, attendez, dans l'ordre. Je vais d'abord demander. Uh, one thing at a time. Mr. Van Dalen, do you want to reply to the blue card question which was put to you? Yes. Thank you. Just thank you um, the, to the member from the Greens. I th regard that as being uh, full support, exactly what I was saying. Um, that is, it's not entirely clear what the status of the flags is either. And I believe that this should be taken to the conference of um, political groups because colleagues are, whether it's pamphlets, whether it's placards, whether it's flags. So thank you very much, member from the Greens, for your support. And I think this should be had out, it should be discussed thoroughly in the Conference of Presidents because it's all very haphazard, it's a very hit and miss. Uh, there is, doesn't seem to be any systematic uh, approach. And thanks to the member from the Greens for their support. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Dalen. Now, um, Mr. Yedatha Babatia, do you accept a blue card? Do you want to reply to Mrs. Jimenez who asked the question? Well, she's now going to, re to ask that question again. It's very brief. I'd like to hear a response from you. What idea do you have of the right to life? What does that mean to you? Well, the right to life is a fundamental right for all people. And I think... This is a fundamental right that needs to be respected. We need to be attentive to it, and uh, you know my political position, uh, so you know my political position even before asking the question. Thank you. I will give you the floor on a point of order. Can I now give a response, which is that it's not impossible for someone who's spoken in the debate to have a blue card question, and I would ask everyone please to respect the time, because we're, it's a bit tight this morning, but you have the floor since you asked. Mr. Evert. Frau Präsidentin, the Madam, Mr. Rameva just said the pamphlets that are being displayed here, I mean, I really couldn't care less. I mean, I'm really not impressed by uh, all of these uh, pamphlets, but please don't equate them to my flag, which is constitutionally protected. They are not the same. This stands for the national sovereignty of my country, and I reject any insinuation that it is comparable with your pamphlets. Thank you. We have taken careful note of that. Mr. Willie Meyer has one and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Madam President. Now, the ultra-Catholic fundamentalist position of the Spanish People's Party is effectively attempting to make an unprecedented step backwards in Spanish law to try to roll back uh, Spanish women's rights, going back 30 years. Now, this fundamentalist, ultra-Catholic patriarchy, uh, as I've said before, uh, is always uh, represented well here in this parliament. Mr. Legutko has said that Ms. Uh, Estrella's report is revolting. These are expressions uh, which are really... Uh, similar to calling the right wing fascist. Now, as I've said, this is retrograde, it's backwards. There are lots of uh, expressions of that kind. So I would say, members, please sign up to the uh, movement against that kind of uh, language. Uh, and we need to get uh, more signatures behind this kind of movement to counter the step backwards in time that we're seeing. We need a unified response from all of the members and groups in Parliament that defend uh, sexual and reproductive rights so that we can say freely that women can choose. And this is a flag, ladies and gentlemen. This is a flag. We uh, believe uh, in this right. Timansky. Thank you very much. Mr. Timansky. Mr. Timansky, please for one minute. 
Madam President, this is a double-edged sword. There is no one absolute value rights of women. There is also the value of uh, the life itself, of the life of the unborn. And we have to discuss this matter with uh, calm. Every one of us, as we are here, has been born, so has started as a couple of cells that later evolved into a human being. And we are uh, exposing ourselves to a ridicule. Uh, please respect the fact that this issue is regulated by the member states. Anyone can be proud uh, of the fact that they come from a country where abortion is available on demand. That's okay. I'm a Pole and I'm uh, proud to come from a country where my life from the start is protected. Europe is one as a whole, but every member state decides on its own. Thank you very much, Mr. Timansky. A blue card. Now, I've got... Um, we really must make progress. Let's take the next speaker, Mrs. Sinclair, for one minute. Mr. President, since the Estrella report was voted on in the European Parliament, I have received more correspondence from constituents on this report than almost any other. This is, of course, a vital policy area, as it affects us all as individuals and as a society. It was also an area in which certain groups may be particularly vulnerable. This includes those in developing nations, the economically disadvantaged and the poorly informed or educated and those women who live in societies in which women are treated unequally or even regarded simply as property. Through my work on the European Parliament's Human Rights Committee, I have witnessed at first hand such situations. There are important debates to be had. Access to contraception, to sexual health, education and health care and abortion are just some of the issues. It will also come as a surprise to learn that in several countries in the EU, the age of consent is as low as 14. These debates must include all actors in society, not just politicians, but also healthcare professionals, teachers, parents, and given the moral implications of the church, the, sh the church should not be made an enemy. The Australia report, however, appears to be dominated by a political agenda, and in my opinion is unacceptable. That's why I could not support it, as I believe this to be a national competence. Merci, Thank, Madame you. Saint -Claire. La parole est... Thank you. Next, um, Mrs. Estrella. So I do apologise. Mrs. Jiménez Peterio, for two minutes. Sí. Eh, eh. Thank you. Well, I have to acknowledge that I am a little surprised by the tone of some of the contributions that have been made this morning. I think that our vote in December made it abundantly clear that policies on sexual and reproductive health are the prerogative of nation states and national parliaments is where they should be debated. And that is why we should direct our efforts to debates there and people raising these issues here are attempting to sidestep the rules of democracy. They are worried that they will not win the debate in their national parliament. Now the People's Party in Spain has received the confidence of voters. We have a majority and will therefore make the changes to legislation that it deems necessary. We defend certain values including the right to life and I would say that nobody could accuse us of trying to curtail women's right. We're trying to reconcile the right to life and the rights of women. They are not irreconcilable. We have to work together to try and strike the proper balance between those competing rights. And we've got certain sections of Europe who will always be against these kinds of moves. And that is why I would support the Commission's moves in this direction. Now, every time I rise to speak. I talk about women's rights. I am a woman, but I haven't heard anyone on the other side say a single word about the rights of the unbo unborn. So we should talk also about their rights. Thank you, Mrs. Jimenez. Next, Mrs. Estrella. Thank you, Madam President. Well, just a, a prior word of clarification. The right wing in the European Parliament has 
used every possible trick in the book to try to uh, cast out my report. The re Estrella report was never put to the vote and for that reason was never rejected. Unlike what some are saying, it has not been shown clearly what the European Parliament's position is and I am convinced that had there not been serious mistakes in translation, particularly into French and German, then my report would have been put to the vote and would have been approved. What is happening in Spain with the law on abortion affects all women. I express my solidarity with the women of Spain. Sexual and reproductive health is not a question of tradition or culture. It is a fundamental right. It is a question of freedom, of dignity and respect for women. Portugal was one of the l last Western countries to legalize abortion in 2007. Before 2007, rich Portuguese women would travel to Spain to abort their pregnancies safely. The poorer women in Portugal uh, underwent illegal abortions. So once again, if the Estrella report had gone forward, it would have uh, changed things, allowing people to abort safely and uh, regardless of their economic condition. Thank you very much. Uh, Madame Thank you very much, Mrs. Cotton Nelson. Um, I see the blue cards, but we've got 12 more names on, in the debate. And I want them to speak first. I want everyone to be able to speak. With them, we have Catch the Eye. Uh, so please, everyone can, everyone calm down and the next speaker, please, Mrs. Cornelison. Six years old, when I first demonstrated for the right to choose, my mother and her generation fought for and won autonomy over her own body. And I thought that these rights, once they were won, were safe for my generation and that of our sons and daughters, uh, that we could go on to fight for other rights that we have yet, not yet to gain, such as equality in business leadership, such as equal parenting, and how extremely depressing is it to find that this is not the case. The Spanish plan for a restrictive abortion law is a huge setback, not only for Spanish women, but for the fight for women's rights everywhere. It means that this fight will never be over. We will have to keep on defending every right forever. And I wish we didn't have to, but if we must, we will fight. I want to assure my Spanish colleagues that they are not alone. They have the full strength of all progressive forces and of the women's rights movement behind them and we will do everything in our Merci. power to make sure that every woman Merci in the EU Madame gets and keeps the right Merci to bien. decide. Je donne la parole. Thank you. Now Mrs. Tomacic for one minute. Madame Tomacic, vous avez la... Mrs. Tomacic, you have the floor. Thank you. Discrimination is an age-old problem and it's very difficult to find a universal solution for it. I believe that all citizens have to be equal before the law and that we have to respect human rights. But I have the impression that some groups want to be more equal and this is a completely wrong direction. Discrimination is discrimination, whether it is negative or positive and therefore it is unfair. The rights of one cannot go to the detriment of the others, and this is the only formula we have to follow. I have to say that I am very sorry that this topic is on the agenda, because I think that the me members of parliament said what they think about it. I'm afraid that some political uh, powers cannot uh, stand democracy, and they use their violent method to uh, impose their ideological uh, stance. We all know that we need a man and a woman to uh, have a child. Uh, once that um, woman can do it by herself, then she can decide by herself. Thank you. Thank you, President. It's, in an, it's inadmissible that today the Parliament is not seeking even theoretically to, to defend the rights of women and their uh, sexual and reproductive rights. We should recall that it took decades to acquire these rights. Many people campaigned uh, long and hard. Many women campaigned long and hard. Instead of going forwards in Spain, 
Spain are now about to go backwards in this regard and this is going to cause suffering to many women especially in the poorer classes. The people who are so concerned about embryos and young ba babies uh, really I feel have got their arguments the wrong way around and are hypocritical. Mrs. Sinclair, point of order, please make your point. Hi, the first point of order is when an MEP asks for a procedural point of order, the President must give way. I think that's in the rule book and you failed to do that. I'm actually calling for you to suspend this debate and put in place a chairman who can competently take this debate. This has been absolute chaos. Your, your absolute bi bigoted bias in this debate has been absolutely disgraceful. Please vacate the chair and put someone else more competent in. Thank you. We'll continue now. Mrs. Morvine has the floor for one and a half minutes. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam President. I was listening very attentively to the men of the left wing here, how they've uh, fought very hard so that our, uh, we women can have control over our, over our own bodies. So you men of the left, maybe you should also draft a report on the responsibility of men in this. I'd be happy to support that report, I think. We could have information campaigns for your male colleagues so that uh, we could also mention the, how uh, we were brought by the stork and uh, how even unplanned children were, are brought by the stork. No, men do have a possibility to make sure that unplanned children come into this world. I think we should have Europe-wide campaigns perhaps that should be launched and make sure that men support women in family planning and maybe the motto could be something like a real man would never uh, ignore a woman, neither in their relationships nor in marriage. So, dear male m uh, members of parliament, you should maybe encourage your male uh, friends and colleagues that if they don't want these unwanted pregnancies to to, uh, to happen. I do have one and a half uh, minutes actually Madam President even if you don't like what I'm saying. So I in unplanned pregnancies maybe men should adopt uh, and assume their responsibility and they should make sure that if a woman should so desire then the woman should be allowed to have the baby and the man as a father should assume responsibility uh, in that decision. If men take the interests of women seriously, that's the way they should react so that in physical and spiritual terms they can make sure that the women don't suffer alone. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to add a, a, an element of rationalism into this. There's a difference here between the end and the means. Any political power, any party, should ultimately aim to defend the lives of any human being, to defend the dignity of all human rights. That's guaranteed. We all agree on the principle of equality. That's a given. So there is no doubt that we should recognise the need to defend all uh, men, irrespective of age, wealth, health. As soon as they're human beings, we would defend them. But then I'm a lawyer. There is not a single document, national or international, in which it's said that uh, nobody is regarded as a, a human right. That's never written down anywhere. There's no argument about that. So we're all trying to, de to defend everybody, women, children, men. That's stated everywhere. There's no real discussion there. Now, no one's really saying that there are human beings that shouldn't be defended. We're never going to say that. It's a question of how. It's a question of the means. It's a question of how we uh, defend complex uh, situations and balance rights uh, and responsibilities. Then there are different appraisals and then of course local sensitivities come in. That's where the principle of subsidiarity bites and that's really what the crux of the debate here is. It's the distinction between the means and the end. 
take pregnancy, for example, it's extremely delicate. It happens once or twice in our life. And there, there is the life of a, a son or a daughter entrusted to a woman. And, of course, the means to defend the right would not be the same as the, the, the means to defend a general right. That's an important distinction. Another important distinction is the clarity of language. We all are in favour of sexual and reproductive health. Of course we are. But we can't add something into this that runs counter to life and health. Abortion is seen as a necessity, but we can't uh, argue that abortion is part and parcel of sexual and reproductive health. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Mrs. Thompson. Madam Thompson. Yeah. Uh, Zach, perform. Thank you, Chair. I'm delighted that we are dealing with this issue today. Equality between genders, freedom and dignity are among the basic values of our union. And such principles and values include the right to sexual and reproductive health and rights. In several member states we see an increase in the number of teenage pregnancy because such rights are not protected there. There is no family planning, there is no access to prevention when it comes to undesired pregnancies. When women don't have a right to a legal abortion, they're also not given access to a right to protect their own bodies. Now we hear that the Spanish government is undergoing a huge setback and taking their legislation 50 years back in time. This development is very unfortunate. The result will be that the women who need an abortion will go abroad and those who stay at home will risk their lives when they're having illegal abortions. We've all witnessed this in the 40s, 60s. We know how many women died when they had to go to such uh, terms and had to end their pregnancy in an illegal fashion. I find it very strange that all of these men who in Spain want to control women's bodies don't, as the former speaker said, focus on men because men have a role to play in this situation too. We know that rapes occur, rape occur in many marriages. Europe is a civilized part of the world. We shouldn't use the methods of Afghanistan. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, European Parliament has no reason to deal with the problem of accessibility of abortion in the EU member states. Today's debate is a waste of time and money. But as so much has been said about Spain, I will say on my behalf, I would like to say that the actions of the government in Madrid deserve our highest praise. Because abortion, especially voluntarily induced abortion, is just an act of barbarity. We will be ashamed of it, just like today we are ashamed of slavery. This is a huge error Europe is making. To the European Commission, I have two questions to Commissioner Callas, very precise. Whether the Commission thinks it has any competence concerning the accessibility of abortion in member states of the EU. And second question, whether the European Commission sees any competence uh, when it comes to the sexual education in schools uh, on the territory of the EU. And I would like to have a legally precise answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleagues, I've already said that we don't have time for blue cards. We have gone beyond the time available for that, so unfortunately I can't give you the floor. Thank you very much, President. A ban or a restriction of the right to abortion is a form of institutional violence against women. It is an expression of unequal treatment of men and women. It is a discrimination of women and this is a breach of their right to health and freedom from inhuman treatment. Uh, Spain is going back to the anti-abortionist rhetorics. It is bowing towards the Catholic Church. It is also trying to um, stop talking about the crisis. It is, uh, it, we should remember that a ban on abortion is an attribute of totalitarian regimes. It uh, was existing under Stalin and under Franco. In Poland we do have an anti-abortion uh, legislation and the results are very bad. We have hundreds 
uh, of we have 100,000 abortions which are illegal per annum and only a few hundred legal ones. Such ro laws are dangerous to the health and life of women. It is a form of discrimination based on wealth because a ban on abortion usually hits the poorer women hardest. I do appeal to, Sp to Spain to not to follow Pol Polish um, example. Mr. Cashman. Mr. Cashman. Thank you, Madam President. I have listened to the views of the other side of the House and I respect their views, but I do not endorse them. I believe that the draft Spanish law discriminates against women and the argument of subsidiarity holds no weight. We express our views on foreign affairs, so why not abolish the Foreign Affairs Committee if we're going to follow through on the argument of subsidiarity? The EU mandates the European Union to defend human rights. And let's be absolutely clear, the Spanish draft law affects us all. If women are denied their basic rights in an EU member state such as Spain, it affects not only those women who live there, but other women citizens of that member state, or uh, any women who work, reside, study, or even go there as tourists. So therefore I say this, I stand by the generation of women who have fought for their right for equality, their right to choose what to do with their body and for their continuing fight. And the denial of the rights of women is a competence of this House. Thank you. Mr. Kassman. Thank you very much. Mrs. Muniz. Thank you, Mr. Podimata. If you were a Spanish woman, Uh, you could uh, chair the European uh, Parliament, the President of the European Parliament, but you wouldn't, in Spain, be in charge of your own body. Uh, in Spain, uh, there's been a call for a free debate on this issue, uh, this draft law in Spain, in the Spanish Parliament, uh, a law which will be a scourge for Spanish women. But no minister, no judge, no psychiatrist, no uh, so-called authority qualified to speak on the rights of women uh, should be able to say that women should not have the right to an abortion uh, when they need to have one for private, personal or family reasons. There are always reasons for abortions and in, when they have to take place they should be able to take place in uh, safety. Uh, there are over 100,000, there will be 100,000 illegal abortions, dangerous illegal abortions in Spain under this new law. Now, uh, what would uh, perhaps uh, reduce the number, of, uh, the number of abortions in Spain would be good health education, good sexual education in Spanish schools. That would be progressive, that would be helpful. But what we have to do is uh, now to reduce the number of children being born when they are not wanted in Spain, which is going to happen more under this legislation. Thank you. Mrs. Beres. Thank you very much, Madam President. We ask that the Spanish government give up on its draft bill on abortion. This text is one which will call into question the rights of women in the most vulnerable positions. It will lead to people having to go to backstreet abortions, leading them into the most dangerous situations. It favorizes the richest women who can carry out their social tourism. This draft bill sends us back to the darkest hour of history in Europe because when the situation of women is attacked, then the history of Europe is attacked. It is the foundation itself of democracy we're talking about. If uh, Mr. Rajoy is not convinced by the European Parliament, well, talk to the WHO, because this is an issue that's very clear when you look at the facts. Now, it's not Mr. Rajoy who uh, will uh, come out of this covered in glory because Mr. Rajoy is going against people such as Simone Weil, who at the dawn of Europe fought for these rights. Obviously, Felipe Gonzalez had used the um, Maastricht Treaty to allow us to have a, a chapter of, on citizenship. Let us refine that spirit of Europeanness. Thank you, Mrs. Beres. I understand that this is a sensitive issue. 
I do share that uh, understanding of sensibility, uh, sensitivity, but please respect your speaking time, please. Mr. Cofferati. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Madam President. Commissioner, when you call into question a uh, fundamental right, like the self-determination uh, for women who are pregnant, it's an unacceptable and serious breach. We know where that is happening. This is an attempt which cannot be attributed to the logic of subsidiarity. We know that we have done something that is unprecedented in Europe in the last decades. We, wrote, we produced the first law that reflects the uh, opinions of the majority of the European citizens. I'm confident that this uh, initiative will be taken on by other parliaments in other member states. Alberto Loris Garadon, they're his words, the Spanish minister who put forward the bill. He said this in an interview with the ABC news channel. So this isn't about rowing back on rights just in Spain. This is an opinion that could well uh, turn into an ideological drive afflicting the whole of Europe. And I think the Commission has to stand up and defend Europe from this risk. Thank you very much, Mr. Cofferati. There are very many people who have asked to be included on the list on Catch the Eye. I'm obliged only to give five colleagues the floor. First of all, Mr. Mikulášik. Thank you very much, Madam President. On two occasions, the will of the European Parliament has uh, been expressed. The Estella report was uh, rejected, for example. But looking at what we're talking about here, this falls purely and squarely within the competence of the Member States. There's a ruling from 2011 of the European Court of Justice banning experiments on embryos. The, uh, the court says that at conception that's when human life starts. Uh, with abortion, it's not just a question of uh, the health of women or the rights of women, it's the rights of the child as well. These children have rights at this stage, including rights of inheritance, and the left persistently is fighting against this and for the destruction of human life. Thank you, President. Uh, the reform of the abortion law in uh, Spain, the Rajoy draft, is an attack on the fundamental rights of women. In fifth, and fi that's 53 per cent of the uh, uh, population. The task of being a mother is the duty of women. It's a task which falls on only to women. But if this law is passed, women will not have equality with men. Their rights will be uh, under, undermined. We have to have equal rights with men. And I would say this, those who uh, raise their voices against legislation which has proved to be effective and good are people who are not respecting the rights of women. So I'm against the reactionary law uh, being promulgated by Rajoy. I am in favour, however, of fundamental rights for men and women. I believe we should be uh, less cynical in this debate, less chest beating, and less just respect fundamental human, human rights. I think the European Commission has a duty here to make sure that the, uh, the rights, human rights in Europe are upheld and fundamental rights are upheld. Those are in the treaty. We all enjoy our fundamental rights and have a right to them. Yeah. Mrs. Vergier. Thank you very much, Madam President. In the European Union, only three countries have restrictive legislation on abor abortion. In Malta, abortion is banned outright. In Ireland, uh, legislation has evolved slightly. In, in Poland, there's a, a new attempt to row back. Spain uh, would like to send women back th by 30 years. Res restricting abortion has never seen a reduction in the number of abortions. It affects the poorest. It increases secret abortions with disregard for their health and their right to life. 
women should be able to determine what they do with their bodies. No one should be obliged to, no one should be obliged to um, impose religious beliefs on women. Reactionary groups that use lies to try to convince others is not worthy of our democracy. We know where ideology is, we know where respect for women's rights is. Going back on women's rights means going back for the whole of society. Thank you, Mrs. Vergia. Now, Mr. Jobron. Chairman, it wasn't, uh, it is not the way the union was supposed to be. The union that is intervening in the issues which are internal to the individual member states and sovereign matters that should be regulated by the individual member states themselves. The union is imposing moral approach which cannot be acceptable. This was not in our agreement. This is not what we wanted when we, uh, w when we joined the union. We must remember that many people in Europe want a European Union, but they want a European Union where, uh, where we can cooperate while being different and while knowing that we have our moral principles. We cannot impose our uh, beliefs upon anyone as regards conscious, as regards, conscious, as regards uh, conscience, as regards moral standards. This may turn against the European Union. Remember that. Thank you very much. Mrs. Head. Sexual and reproductive health and rights is an area where the Commission hasn't said a great deal. In fact, we haven't heard a great deal over the last 10 years since I've been in Parliament from them. Yes, it's a sensitive issue. Yes, it divides our continent, divides our political parties. But Contrary to the EPP and certain other colleagues and what they think, the European citizens have an interest to make sure that the whole of Europe rep um, pays homage to these reproductive health and rights because if they don't do that there are diseases which can be spread across national borders. It's not such a long time ago that homosexuality was seen side by side with pedophilia in Swedish textbooks. That's something that still happens in Europe and prevents the free movement of homosexuals. The extreme right in Europe think that the wind is in their sails and it's incumbent on the Parliament, the Council and the Commission to do something against this. It is frightening to see what happened with the lobbyism on the Estrella report. The EU has to be prepared to stand up against this, even against uh, the extreme right. Our continent has seen both dark periods and lighter periods on sexual enlightenment, but to go from the light to the dark in the case of Spain is unacceptable. Thank you very much, Mr. Stier. Thank you very much, Madam President. This whole debate on, uh, is on a Spanish bill, so I'll use Spanish. Some people don't think that human, that think that human beings be begin with conception. Clearly they don't understand genetics. Some people are clearly stuck with middle-aged beliefs uh, and rather retrograde. We have to get with the picture and understand 21st century sology. Uh, life begins with conception. We have to defend it. This is not a debate for this parliament. It's for the Spanish uh, parliament. Okay, go on. Uh, live in Spain, fine, but this is a Europe of rights and freedom. Thank you very much, Mr. Steer. Uh, colleagues, before passing the floor to Commissioner Callas, I would like to recall that members who had not the opportunity to talk uh, can, hand, can hand, according to the rules, in a written statement of not more than 200 words, which will be appended to the verbatim report of the debate. Now, Commissioner Callas. Madam President, honorable members, <clears throat> thank you very much for your, your remarks and, and comments on this very very sensitive issue. The Commission uh, has been asked to make a statement for this um, uh, plenary session. There is no document um, uh, for discussion. But I can say as uh, some remarks that the Commission, of course, fully recognizes that each and every individual 
has the fundamental right of access to high quality health care. But I also must say that um, what you know very well is that in relation to health and health care, the treaties have granted limited competence to the European Union. The treaties stipulate that the definition of health policies and the organization and delivery of health services and medical care is the responsibility of individual member states, responsibility that the European Union respects. The Commission acknowledges the differences um, in the EU member states' national policies and laws with regard to these sensitive issues, especially with regard to abortion. And answering to some concrete questions, according to the Treaty of the European Union and the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, the EU has no competence on abortion policy at national level and can therefore not interfere in member states' policies in this uh, area. Also, sex education is also the competence of, of member states. EU can facilitate the exchange of best practices and it is, it is doing this. But of course I can also say that the Commission is, is clearly committed to work to abolish any form of discrimination in healthcare together with the European Parliament and Member States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. That concludes the debate, ladies and gentlemen. So we now move on to the next agenda item. And this is an oral question to the Commission, and the issue is recognising ecological damage in EU and international law. This is an oral question which has been tabled by three committees. So, first of all, I'd like to give the floor to our colleagues Lepage from the, from the Environment Committee. President. The question of environmental damage has been debated frequently in this Parliament and it's becoming increasingly important because it can be uh, irreversible, especially when species become extinct. I would remind you that the services given to us by uh, nature represent 23 billion euros a year, half the world GDP. The 2005 directives on uh, environmental responsibility recognises this, but excludes as a number of uh, categories of damage, uh, such as um, environmental catastrophe, uh, catastrophes or disasters involving the spillage of fossil fuels at sea, oil pollution. In 2003, the International Oil Pollution Compensation Supplement, uh, Supplementary Fund was sufficient. But today uh, we no longer, however, have the possibility of uh, dealing with or repairing environmental damage on a community basis. Whereas on the other hand, in the United States, environmental damage is recognized by in American legislation. Um, the Court of Justice of the European Union has affirmed the principle of polluter pays as a general principle. Uh, this uh, was a judgment arising from the Erica case. And finally, uh, in this last uh, case, I had the honour of representing the French uh, uh, local authorities in which the French uh, Cassation Court or Court of Appeal uh, recognised the principle of environmental damage uh, which w w could be compensated for. Now, I'd like to ask the Commission, are you considering uh, supporting the idea of revising the con uh, uh, Convention on Civil Responsibility for uh, Pollution? That's to say, are you envisaging taking action in the international framework, or are you envisaging revising your position by setting up a specific fund uh, to complement the CEPOL uh, fund uh, uh, to complement that fund when it comes to uh, pollution damage. And now Mrs. Meissner. Thank you very much, President. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, you might, might be surprised that the Transport Committee is also the lead on environmental pollution. But this is environmental pollution at sea, indeed caused by a tanker disaster. Uh, it was the Erica oil tanker that uh, ran aground and there was massive ecological damage and that's why the Erica 3 package was proposed by the Commission. Absolutely right, but there was uh, the issue of oil, um, purely ecological damage caused by oil at sea is not being covered. So we want to have clean water, we have integrated maritime policy and we want to allow ship traffic to go ahead. As preventative measures we've made sure that all tankers in future must be double hulled which should 